nerds. <laughs> Hi. Um, I'm a mere disc jockey. I'm not an engineer, but I've got a studio at home, so I'm a bit of a nerd, and I understand some of the tech kind of side of things. But what have commercial radio done for us, ever done for us? Well, if we look at how it started, um, 8th of October 1973, LBC starts, uh, closely followed by Capital, Clyde, then BR&B &B and Piccadilly. 19 stations by 1976. And right now, here in 2023, we have record audiences of 39.2 million, 740 million revenue, and a listening share of 54.5%. But how did it, I want a microphone like that. <laughs> Apparently that was called the bomb. Anyway, um, yeah, the BBC and the Pirates, of course, um, ruled the first 50 years from 1922 to 73. But the BBC in 1967 finally embraced the self-op studio, thanks to Kenny Everett and Tony Blackburn. They designed or helped design the new continuity studios for Radio 1. Uh, thanks to eBay, I own Radio 1B, the sign outside one of the continuity suites. I'm not much of a nerd. I've cuddled it and gone to bed with it. Um, <coughs> embracing this pioneering spirit drives huge change and improvements for presenters, with most commercial station studios being self-op. Um, and then we have the seven. Look at that. Radio Hallam, 1974. You get to see some of that studio, actually, in action shortly. Because their, their launch didn't quite go to plan. I just want to go into that photo and sit in that studio. I own the middle PPM meters of that as well. <laughs> Sorry. You can see the tobacco staining right at the back. Um, anyhow, uh, there's uh, LBC's uh, David Jessel in 1973, and a new technology allowed them to broadcast remotely from breaking news story locations using those Pi UHF radio telephone telephones that you used to see in the Sweeney uh, back in the day. And uh, there's the SM and Tech Op desk. Look at those ITC cart machines. They had these big green buttons, but they had this... Um, Capstan motors, anyone remember those machines? Yeah, yeah, yeah. With a capstan motor just whirring away. Um, and then we, oh, there's our leader, Tony Blackburn. Tony Blackburn. God! Sorry, high legend. <laughs> he should be OBE or MBE, shouldn't he? Um, so what is the first thing that commercial radio did for us? Well, if you notice there, the quadrant reverse faders, because the BBC, the rever they would reverse the faders because you could knock them and start something. Rubbish. Commercial radio, push them forward. <laughs> there you go. That's how it should be. Go on. Look at that action on that audit's desk. Go on. <laughs> Again? Yeah. Um, now, we know a few station launches can be stressful, but for Radio Hallam, it didn't quite go to plan. The great exhibition for building and construction. Now packing the City Hall Manchester, the Norville Exhibition. Hundreds of products for new buildings. They've been on air about two hours. I suppose the biggest embarrassment was when one of the turntables went down. In fact, you were there with Roger when literally he was stuck with one turntable. Normally on a radio station you have three turntables, so hopefully uh, two out of those three will work. But uh, two went down at one time, which was rather embarrassing. Oops. Um, now, the regulator, of course, the IBA. You're listening to an experimental transmission being made by the Independent Broadcasting Authority. Uh, they used to have surprise station visits from the IBA to check if the guidelines were being followed. Imagine that Ofcom turning up now going, you all right? Yeah, just checking everything these days. So it was very different back in the 70s. Um, more on that later, but what else has commercial radio done for us? The seven second delay. Uh, this, is the, uh, this is Pennine Radio's MD, Stephen Harris, on launch day, showing off their station built delay system. In fact, this machine over my shoulder, um, built by our own people and completed only about uh, eight hours ago, is uh, a device uh, that delays the output of the station. We run on seven seconds delay for all phoning programs and indeed any discussion programs that uh, might be controversial. So uh, any libel or blasphemy or swearing uh, can be censored. How, how do, for, for lots of people in this room, I'm guessing, that sounds very familiar, doesn't it? The fact only built eight hours ago or just finished eight hours ago. Um, oh, shall we go shopping? Commercial time. <laughs> Let's build a studio, shall we? So what shall we have in the 70s? You could have an Alice AM 82B Series 2 broadcasting version of the AM Series 2 range, if you want. 
I think Metro and T's bought these. Uh, you obviously need some tape machines to go with it. There's uh, Radio Trent's Alan Bailey, who produced a lot of the uh, Monty Python albums when he was working at Radio Luxembourg. And uh, there's one of the Levers Rich equipment uh, um, tape machines. Studer, we wanted to get a Studer here on stage, but they're just a bit heavy. Um, <laughs> but I was going to physically edit on tape in front of you all this afternoon. Um, what else we got? Grams. Um, I own three EMT 948s and two 950s. I'm a nerd. Um, but yeah, there's Technics SP10s. I've got two of those as well. I haven't got any rust go turntables. Don't rob me. Um, needles as well, styluses. You have the Stanton 500 or 680 or the Pickering 625 DJs, which I have on my EMTs. Um, <laughs> carts. So literally, we have play out, the, play out these days. But every single jingle and every single commercial was on cartridge, these endless loops of tape. Um, does anyone remember carts? Yeah. Who's never held a cartridge? Hands up. You're welcome to come to my house in Barnsley and we can cart some up if you want. Um, what else we got? Microphones. There's the trusty D202, which if you watch PMQs, you can still see the trusty D202. Still got them in studio. <laughs> you still got them? If you look at ones I've got, I think I've got one from Pennine or something and it's just yellow and full of... I could probably rebuild with DNA the entire DJ lineup. <laughs> uh, 1980s, and there is the legend that is David Lloyd. <laughs> there he is. That's at Leicester Sound, right? MBI. MBI Series 10. What was that like to use that studio? That's horrible compared to the Neve. <laughs> oh, was it? Yeah, you had the Neve at Trent, didn't you, of course? The 80s. Now, for those who got into computers early on, like I did, I had a ZX Spectrum. Um, you could record computer programs off the radio and then load them onto your computer. And uh, Radio West in Bristol were the first to do this. So this is really pioneering. Um, and then, of course, every year the radio and television book came out so you could get extra nerdy about what the IBA were doing in tech. Uh, but if you didn't live or, or you were outside the TSA, you know, they tried to monetize the brand, you know, you could listen for 25 pence a minute to Radio Air if you were, I don't know, visiting friends in Nottingham. I'm missing out on James Whale late at night. I'm just going to listen. Um, and then by the 80s, um, the radio studio starts to see the slow integration of moving from vinyl to CDs. That was those uh, techniques with the SP1200s or something like that. Um, and then dynamics and processing. I was talking about the IBA earlier on in their spot checks. Some stations hid their Optimods under floorboards <laughs> and literally removed them from the TX chain on arrival of an IBA spot inspection. Uh, and then, of course, we get to uh, the 1980s, 1984, the Nescafe Network Charles Star. And then, of course, uh, we had Radio Radio, the superstation that, that came on a little bit later. Counted Sound, uh, I think they split in 1986 with many others from 1988 onwards as well. Innovation of split programming in the 1980s as well. And AM audiences led the start, but FM came later. All right. I was just hoping, don't crash it, don't crash it. Oh, flying eye, anyone? 95.8, traffic update. Look at that, eh? Um, Capital's Flying Eye, again, groundbreaking commercial radio technology, and carts. So as some stations split and did split programming, you had to play all of the split commercials from cart, and there's so many questions. You know, will they all fire? Will they all be queued in the right place? Will the brakes be the same? I guess we're still asking these questions now, aren't we, in some respects? <laughs> Will the presenter be concentrating on that next link if they're juggling? All of these questions still relevant today, but uh, what else have we got here? Oh, the 1990s. Good old Pac-Man. Um, and then Selector arrives in 1990, which changes everything, because before that, the DJ used to pick their own music. You'd have a box in the studio with an A-list, B-list, and C-list, and you played a song from the front of the A, and you just put it to the back, and it rotated like that. And then DJs would start to play whatever they wanted. But stations obviously wanted to tighten things up. And this is what it looked like when it arrived at Red Rose and Red Rose Gold. When it plays, there we go.
Inside Red Rose Radio's two Preston stations, the talk is of the marketplace, research findings and audience reach. The secret is Selector, a computer system imported from America. This does the job of producers and some would say of disc jockeys. On the Gold Station, for example, three and a half thousand titles have been programmed into it. The computer decides when to play them. Some are repeated every nine days, some every 20 days, some every 28 days. The DJs have little room for manoeuvre. When you spend money researching um, what people want out there, I mean, it'd be quite easy to, to let just one person come on the air and, and ruin that for you, you know. A lot of money's gone into this, and, uh, and we're hoping to grab the audience, and we're doing it. I know. So, uh, yeah, don't let DJs rule and play what they want. Uh, there's one of my old selector logs from Air FM. What was that song I spotted? Vibology, Paula Abdul. Gosh, there's one from the past. Um, and then satellite media services. Now, I mentioned that the network chart show, that was fed up the IRN mono line, I think, back in the day. But then satellite media services, who were actually based next to Capital in Newton Tower, started the chart show distribution via satellite from, uh, from rugby. And then ads and station uh, shows that you know you would usually have to sit and wait for a feed and put it on quarter inch. All of that was sent up from SMS on these modified DAT machines from HHB. And then logging, you know, we used to have to physically change the logging tapes. They ran at one and seven eighth IPS, and it was a responsibility of the overnight presenter, which I was, to change the logger tapes, um, which changed again because of the PCM. Sony machine, which meant you could record logger audio digitally onto cassette, or onto video, should I say, onto VHS tape. So you'd have FM feed on the left channel, on the right you would have AM, and then you'd have the CCTV back in the day, all thanks to this machine here. And then Playout arrives, and Capital were running all of their ads, this is a great clip, Capital were running all of their ads from the DAMS machine in 1990. <laughs> are having a two million pound giveaway. Two million pounds, eh? We could buy a yacht. They're not giving it all to one person, Roger. While stocks last, you can save 10% on all habitat furniture and upholstery, and up to 50% on all sorts of things in every department, which is more than two million pounds worth of savings. Maybe we could all club together for the yacht. Hello, Auntie. Oh, very well. Madison is, that's 1990, how far we've come. And then play out arrives, of course, DCS at Chilton in 89, the BCX, uh, jukeboxers. Um, oh, look at that. That's amazing, isn't it? They're not all, uh, not all pretty by modern standards. Um, anyone remember um, RCS DOS? That's one of my logs, actually, from Galaxy back in the day. And um, it was bomb. I couldn't. I mean, I'm a numpty. I couldn't even crash that thing. Um, and then Dalit arrives. And Hallam was the testing site for Dalit, uh, for Dalit back then. But we were still using Audisk uh, for ad playout. And then ISDN, anyone? Back in the day, they used to go for a fortune, those. You literally trip over them now, don't you? And, uh, but that meant you could do shows from all around the world. Anybody went on any of those OB trips around the world? Oh, there's our leader again. Tony Blackburn. God love you. There you are. Um, and then when Heart launched, um, this, was, this was pioneering because their test transmissions were a relay of New York's 95.5 WPLJ, WPLJ, which was clearly inspired by Classic FM's Birdsong launch in 92, which there's a whole Wikipedia entry about Birdsong, which I'm sure you all, all know. Um, but visualization arrives in 1998, where you can actually watch a DJ on the radio. Chris Evans' daily radio show, when he went from Radio 1 to Virgin, you could watch on Sky One. Is your weekend that bad? Yeah, pretty bad, well, let, me, yeah. let me just cheer you up. I was voted most loathed man on television. No. Oh, baby. And I beat Jeremy Beadle, oh. Des O'Connor, oh. Jim Davidson, oh. and Jimmy Hill. Oh. Usually, the people who are in the loathed are also in the Love. most liked. I am the first most loathed, and I'm not in the most <laughs> loathed. And that was, you know, that was pretty groundbreaking to see inside a, a radio studio. That's 1998. Uh, and then we get to the, the noughties. No. Oh. That's the Pulse's desk in Studio One. But that signals the start of, of the digital age. Uh, here's a, a Klotz Vardis installation at Galaxy 102 in Manchester in the noughties. Still running the RCS DOS. There's the old cart wall there. We used to use these alpha block things to edit. 
which was not the easiest way of editing, but it was a really good system. Um, then Master Control arrives, of course. Um, and then UK Radio Aid in the mid noughties And this is when the entire radio industry came together. Was anyone involved in the transmission of, of Radio Aid in this, in this room? And it was pretty groundbreaking, wasn't it? Bringing everyone together and getting all the groups to actually agree and talk to each other. And I think something like three million was, um, was, was raised. And was there a UK leaders? There was a 2005 election, wasn't there? And I think there was a UK leaders one when all the commercial radio stations came together as well. And then Powerlog arrives. So no more VHS cassettes, thanks to the guys at Broadcast Radio who created and that set. Great, great piece of software, that. Phone box, of course, thanks to Bionic, Broadcast Bionics, and, uh, which is now brought, uh, Bionic Studio Talk Show. Those gentle phone lines, which you could never, oh God, you could never get callers to air, especially if you needed to move through some callers really quickly. Um, and the growth of SMS and social media tools. And how we see studios, you know, all that oak furniture is long gone and the look and feel. And you look at how that heart studio looks now and they, it's just about getting there, isn't it? Adding some lighting and what looks good on camera and LBC studios today. And these brand extensions, all of this innov innovation from commercial radio. Um, and then you have this, Project Banana, which was one breakfast show and seven playlists. Hi, I'm Christian O'Connell uh, from The Breakfast Show on Outsuit Radio. That's, um, Richard. what's his name? Uh, we do The Breakfast Show now live on Outsuit Radio Classic Rock, uh, noughties, eighties, nineties, seventies, all these different radio stations. Sixties, Outsuit yep. Radio sixties. Do we? Yes. Really? There's a station for that? Anyway, we're live across all of them. Amazing, isn't it? And uh, obviously, I know how this works. I was kind of instrumental in putting it all together. How it works is it's quite complicated. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yes, this, this screen here, um, it's like a TV monitor, and I press this button here next, and seven songs are played at the same time, and they're all roughly the same length. So when I talk, when the song ends, they all end. Brilliant. Are we really on 60s? <laughs> um, but better or no ads. Advertisers get more targeted listeners with new targeting and ad replacement technology. Uh, David, of course, back at LBC in, was it 2006 with the first podcasts? Dave Walters, yep. Yeah, which again <laughs> is, is completely groundbreaking and comes from commercial radio. And boom radio, radio without studios. This just shows you, you don't need buildings anymore. And boom, um, and I'm bigging, bigging it up in front of you, but it just shows you, and we all know that model, how it can be a success if, it, if it's done right. And that's, there's David's log uh, from a couple of weeks, uh, from last week. Um, from this morning, is that this morning's log? Um, and commercial radio breaking boundaries again, the first time a dog ever hosted a radio show. <laughs> Rock dog, do you want to hear it? Kerrang Radio presents one hour of unique radio programming from the Kerrang Kennels. This is the only show on earth hosted by a dog. Introduce the song. Although when it was off, uh, Rockin' Horse stood in for it. Uh, but it pissed on the floor, so they didn't let it do it again. Uh, so what has Commercial Radio ever done for us as I rush through this with 40 seconds to go on the timer? We've innovated programs, innovated commercially, innovative engineers, inno innovate for listeners, and we drive BBC Engineering to innovate and sometimes collaborate too. So it's done a lot, hasn't it, in the last 50 years, and let's look forward to the next 50 years. Thank you very much. Thank you.